In numerous videos, we have seen evolutionary explanations of different groups of animals as well as different structures, but these explanations don't do anything for our day-to-day -day lives. So does evolution impact our daily lives at all? Well, let's find out. <laughs> We saw in Darwin Day and 15 Questions for Evolutionists that creationists think evolution has no practical value. However, even if that were true, evolution wouldn't be false. That also wouldn't make creationism true since it certainly has no practical value. What makes something true isn't whether or not it's useful. It's such silly reasoning I can't believe anyone would even insinuate that that's the case. As it happens, though, evolution is both true and useful. Creationism, on the other hand, has produced nothing in science since it's neither true nor useful. That doesn't mean creationists can't be good scientists. They can, such as Raymond Damadian, who contributed a significant amount of information that was instrumental in creating the first magnetic resonance scanning machine. But they didn't use the Bible, nor what they call creation science, to figure out anything about the real world. We can, however, use evolution to figure out things about the real world. For instance, why do we continually produce new vaccines? New vaccines are continually produced because viruses evolve defenses against the older ones through such processes as antigenic drift and shift. Antigenic drift is the gradual accumulation of mutations in viruses that cause vaccines to become ineffective. On the other hand, antigenic shift is when two or more strains of viruses combine to form a new subtype of virus, which again causes vaccines to become ineffective. I wonder, though, if creationists would say that both viruses are still in the virus kind. Oh well. It's also the case that viruses can evolve within a single individual. HIV is an infamous example because it evolves so fast. Many other pathogens, such as some species of bacteria, evolve resistance to our antibiotics as well. But HIV can become resistant in a matter of months or weeks in a single infection. HIV's ability to rapidly evolve also means that an effective vaccine is hard to develop. So how do doctors deal with such a rapid evolver? By using the principles in evolution. Even though it evolves ridiculously fast, HIV still has to follow these principles. One of them is that mutations are random, and such that the chance of getting one particular mutation is relatively high compared to multiple independent mutations. When we treat HIV with one type of drug, a relatively low number of mutations would make it resistant. However, when using multiple types of drugs at the same time, more mutations are needed for it to be resistant to all of them. So, multi-drug treatment decreases the chance of HIV evolving resistance. Another medical strategy that can be used to combat HIV uses the principle of evolutionary trade-offs. When HIV evolves resistance to drugs, there comes a cost with it such that under a drug-free environment, drug-resistant strains are less fit than non-resistant ones. We can exploit this by interrupting therapies with drug-free periods, which allows the non-resistant strain to come back and drown out the resistant strains before applying the drug again. Switching back and forth like this allows us to keep both the non-resistant and resistant strains in check, thereby limiting the overall population. Next, phylogeography, which is the study integrating data on geographical distribution with the evolutionary relationships of organisms that use the same principles of homology and comparative genomics that demonstrate universal common descent, has also been invaluable in studying the outbreak and spread of diseases. A recent iconic example was the use of phylogeography to trace the origin of the 2014 Ebola outbreak to Guinea and see how it twice independently spread to Sierra Leone. Another example is the spread of the H3N2 subtype of the influenza A virus, which was tracked back to China. The 2014 paper on the subject, Unifying Viral Genetics and Human Transportation Data to Predict the Global Transmission Dynamics of Human Influenza H3N2, says, Quote, Although identifying the causes of pathogen spread is of great importance in spatial epidemiology, integrating this information in evolutionary models also offers major advantages for phylogeographic reconstructions and their relevance to infectious disease surveillance and pandemic preparedness. Close quote. 
On a more local scale, the pedigree of some viruses can even be tracked as it is transmitted from person to person, as seen in the 2013 paper, tracking a hospital outbreak of carbapenem-resistant Klebsiella pneumoniae with whole genome sequencing. Yet another medical application is how it helps in our understanding of genetic diseases. In most cases, an individual must have both copies of a recessive allele to be expressed. Carriers who are heterozygous won't become sick, so they are effectively invisible to selection, which allows the allele to linger in a population. There are even cases where the recessive allele persists in a population due to selection. A famous example is the sickle cell trait, which gives carriers a greater resistance to malaria infection. Such a phenomenon is called heterozygote advantage, wherein heterozygosity provides a higher fitness than either homozygous genotypes. This explains why sickle cell anemia is common in areas where malaria runs rampant, and why individuals with ancestors who came from these areas have an increased chance to be a carrier. However, not all alleles causing such diseases are there because they are favored by selection. Genetic drift is an important factor here, which is a phenomenon wherein alleles spread throughout a population simply by chance alone. A good example of this is called the founder effect, wherein a new population is established by a small group of individuals migrating to a new area and are genetically isolated from the main population. This causes a decrease in genetic diversity, but also allows otherwise rare alleles to become more common. This is why we find a lot more genetic disorders in communities that are known to have been founded by a small number of individuals, such as the Amish. So what can we do with this information? In light of evolutionary principles, we can determine your risk factor for various genetic diseases before the disease is expressed. We can also make informed reproductive choices, preventing these alleles from being passed on. Please note, this is not saying we should support eugenics like forcefully sterilizing carriers. What we can do is pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which involves checking embryos, or even gametes, prior to fertilization for these alleles, such that we can implant an embryo with a phenotype absent of any genetic disorder causing allele. And all of these are choices that the couple who want to have a baby should make for themselves after they receive the information. The phylogenies of cancer cells can also be studied, since tumors are composed of different cell types. It is possible to understand the evolution of mutant cells in the different tissues. That way, you can see which mutations were there first and which ones occurred later. Knowledge that can be important in deciding how to treat the individual patient. This field is called tumor phylogenetics. Look it up. The way cancer cells evolve is called clonal evolution, and it is a big deal in the progression of cancer. Cancer cells strongly compete with each other for resources. Some clones might have mutations that give them an advantage over others. If this happens, these will quickly outcompete the others. This is why we see cancer progressively acquiring genetic changes, giving them abnormal abilities that help them proliferate. The landmark paper, titled The Hallmarks of Cancer by Hanahan and Weinberg, lists some of the most important abilities. These include the evasion of apoptosis, sustained angiogenesis, and even metastasis. As the paper reads, quote, Observations of human cancer and animal models argue that tumor development proceeds via a process formally analogous to Darwinian evolution, close quote. Cancer is even able to evolve resistance to chemotherapy, just like HIV evolving resistance to our drugs. This is why the same chemotherapy that caused remission in a patient won't be as effective after relapse. The cancer cells that relapsed are the descendants that survived the chemotherapy due to mutations that made them resistant. What can we do with this information? We can apply the same strategy as with HIV, using multiple chemo drugs such that it is difficult for cancer to evolve resistant clones. This is not a very new idea. It was a major breakthrough in cancer therapy when Holland, Freyrich, and Frey proposed the idea in 1965 and they applied it by treating child acute lymphoblastic leukemia or ALL patients. As a result of this, ALL has become a largely curable disease in children. So evolution plays a role in making vaccines as well as treating cancer. So we see that evolution helps us understand the spread of pathogens in cancer. Evolution is not just some lofty technical construct totally unconnected from daily life. It has very real consequences for all of us and can be used to benefit human health. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.